second. I think Megan's going first. Okay. Yeah, that actually works better for me. Perfect. Thanks, Megan. Yeah. Okay. Can everybody see that? Looks cool. good. All right. Well, hello. So I've spoken to this group once before, I think uh, just a couple months ago, and I was talking through kind of the basics of thinking about accessibility. Today, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about some hands-on kind of tangible pieces that you can practice. Um, typically, when I offer these uh, workshops, I have more of a teaching and learning specifically academic courses and specifically the use of Carmen Canvas. Um, a little bit more of that spin on it, but this is a slightly different version and so I hope this is relevant to everyone here today. Um, so a little bit about me. My name is Megan Fogel. I'm an instructional designer and our accessibility lead on our distance education team here in the Office of Distance Education and E-Learning. Um, so if you haven't worked with us before, we're a team of about 10 instructional designers and some other support staff, and we work primarily on fully online courses for Ohio State Online, our 30 plus fully online degree programs. Um, so day to day, I'm working with instructors on their, their academic courses, but I also do a ton of this type of outreach um, for accessibility conversations um, across campus. Um, so I'm gonna jump in to what we're talking about today, we want to understand the need for fixing accessibility issues. Um, you guys have that piece a little bit in you just by being here today, um, but we're going to talk a little bit more about the reasons why. We're going to identify some accessibility issues and fixes, and we're going to talk about how to establish some accessible content creation habits. So I don't want this to be something that feels overwhelming. I want it to be something that feels really doable, um, that you can start with baby steps and it just becomes part of your nature to think about, oh, what is the accessibility of this thing that I've created or this thing that I'm going to use? Um, so I'm gonna jump right in. So when we think about accessibility, sometimes we think about physical spaces and I think that's what, um, what Laura is gonna be talking about a little bit later too. Um, I'm talking about digital spaces. Faces. And sometimes we don't know what our learners or our users or our readers, um, what they're facing, but we do know that they're incre increasingly diverse, um, that they interact with us and, and the content through a screen, that they learn in different ways and that they face dif different roadblocks. And so my goal when I talk about this is to think about how we can be proactive um, instead of reactive to their needs. Um, and so if you guys are familiar with the way that academic courses um, work in terms of accessibility accommodations on campus. We have people that might think about accessibility if they've, if they've spent any time with me um, or if they've done research on their own. Um, but then, and those are the pre proactive folks. And then we have um, reactive through student life disability services or those that might go in and, um, and reactively caption a video when there's a student with a specific issue, right? And so we don't ever um, want to have to be in that defensive position trying to scramble to make something more accessible. And I think that goes the, it goes the same for, um, for your content as well, right? We wanna make sure that we're thinking about the needs of our users before they come to us with a complaint, right? So alongside digital accessibility, a lot of people often talk about universal design for learning. And so that's the UDL here in this graphic. Um, I'll refer to it as UDL. And if you want, you can, you can do a little bit of research. Universal design is a concept that applies to a lot of different disciplines. Um, but just recently, we've been talking and learning more about universal design for learning um, and for content presentation and for all that kind of stuff. And so as much as I don't like to put people into categories. I think sometimes if we haven't thought about this before, we need to understand what are the unique challenges of the people, right? And so to better understand that and to be thorough about thinking about those unique challenges, universal design and digital accessibility um, together help to address the differences of those with mobility, vision, hearing, learning, communication, and attention differences. Those last three, learning, communication, and attention, are sometimes grouped together as cognitive disabilities. Um, they're the ones that, that take a little bit more um, 
kind of creative thought or out of the box thinking when you're thinking about what would be the challenge of accessing this material or understanding this concept, right? Um, or even what would be distracting on this web page for someone with an attention disorder, right? Um, mobility, vision, and hearing, we talk about a lot because um, they're a little bit easier to understand what the limitations of those are, right? So for mobility, we think about somebody that might not be able to use a mouse um, in the digital space and might need to rely on using a keyboard. Um, for vision, we think about somebody that's needing to use a screen reader to have the content on their computer read aloud to them. Um, for hearing, we think about those that need captions, right, or need transcripts of audio. Um, so there's tons more to talk about with Universal Design for Learning, but I want to get in, into the less squishy stuff. I want to get into the really tangible, um, easy fixes that you can add to your content creation habits. So I have a thing here and I want to see if you guys can pop it into the chat and let me see if I can even open the chat so I can see it. Yep. Um, I have a prompt here. And so this is a little bit more for an academic um, course maybe, but I think it might be relevant to you as well. So if this were a prompt, find an image that represents cognitive bias in society. And maybe this is for a socio sociology course or something like that. What would be the problematic word that makes this less inclusive or less accessible than it could be. And type into the chat. Jenny got it. Yeah, so Jenny said image. Um, and this is, yeah, this is a fairly easy one to see what the, no pun intended, to, to understand what the, um, the limitations would be in the ask here, in the prompt here. And so if we switch that to find an artifact, that represents cognitive bias in society. All of a sudden we understand that there's, there's podcasts and there's articles and there's videos and there's all these types of things that um, a user could, could find to show that they understand this. So thinking about the, the subtle ways that even the wording um, of your materials can, can alienate folks. So there are three pillars of universal design for learning, and, and we're not gonna dive too much deeper into these, but just so that you understand that there is, there is a framework for questions to ask yourself. Um, it's providing multiple ways for students to connect or interact with the content. And so that's multiple means of engagement, how they're engaging with the content. Multiple means of representation, how they are getting that content. So is it displayed on a, on an accessible web page? Is it in an accessible PowerPoint or Word document? And then multiple means of expression would be more for when they're interacting it with you or, um, or with the learning to make sure there's a variety of opportunities and methods for how they demonstrate that. Um, and so I think that this will come into play not only with content that you put out, but, but with activities that you develop for your audiences. All right. So getting into the more tangible stuff, and I'm happy to take questions about universal design for learning at any time. Um, I'll leave my contact info at the end, too, because I know there's always kind of those squishy situations that you want to talk through. What is this accessible? Am I thinking about this the right way? Right. But getting into the more tangible, we've got five common issues and solutions. These are things that I see all the time in academic courses, but I see them on websites, I see them in PowerPoints all the time. I see them in emails, right? Just these little mistakes that can be made that, um, that are, are so common and they're also very easy to fix, which is an exciting piece of it. So the first one we're gonna talk through is um, documents that you have. Um, and so I have a feeling that plenty of you have PDFs upload it onto a website or that you're emailing PDFs out to folks. Um, we want to make sure that those aren't just scanned documents because um, that would just be an image of text. Um, this is one of the most common things that we see in online courses as well and it's just if you were to grab a book off a shelf and scan it in it's just an image of text right those of us with vision um, would be able to read that but we wouldn't be able to search for keywords or highlight when we're on a treadmill with our iPad and all that kind of stuff, right? And so it's something that would benefit everyone. But when you think about um, the usability for those with vision differences, if it's just an image of text, the screen reader or the computer cannot interact with that text. And so what needs to happen is 
you would run it through optical character recognition or OCR. Um, and so I typically use Adobe Acrobat Pro, which is something that's available to all um, staff, I believe. Um, there are plenty of other PDF readers out there. And so a quick Google search of OCR and then your software that you're using would allow you to find the step-by-step -step directions of, of how to run optical character recognition. And it does what it says. It recognizes the characters in the document and outputs really readable text um, that you'd be able to highlight and copy and paste and all that kind of stuff. So that's a very easy one. It takes about a couple minutes. I think I ran a 15 page document through it the other day and it, I mean, it took maybe a minute. Um, yeah, so that's definitely something I would encourage you to do. Um, here's a screenshot of what that actually looks like in Adobe Acrobat Pro. This is a, a document from my, um, a reading I had to do for my online masters, right? And so I noticed that it was just a picture of text. And so I went over to tools, text recognition in this file, and then I ran it and it, um, it scanned it, it understood that it was, that was English, um, and then it, it created searchable text there. So that's optical character recognition. Um, other documents that we might be distributing, right? Word and PowerPoint, pretty common. Um, so there are accessibility features built into both Word and PowerPoint to ensure that your document can be made more accessible um, as itself, but also that it, it could be converted more easily into an accessible PDF. Um, most of the time, the PDFs that we're generating are, um, were originally created in Word or PowerPoint, right? Um, we wanna make sure that that is overall readable by a screen reader and is usable um, by somebody that needs to navigate through the document and through the heading styles that you might use in that document um, to really navigate it more easily instead of starting at the top and going line by line. Right. Um, so best practice here is to make use of heading styles um, or templates. And so if you've got access to a really good Word document template that you might want to continue to use um, for all of your documents or PowerPoint template. Um, I am using a PowerPoint template right now that was provided by my office. Right. And it ensures that my titles are always set to the same type of heading level and my fonts are fairly consistent, even though I, I promise you I'm not a pro with PowerPoint and this one would probably not pass a marketing review. Um, but I know that because I'm using a template, it is um, much more accessible than if I were to just start dragging and dropping text boxes on my own. Um, we wanna make sure that we're adding alt text on images and I'm gonna go through that a little bit um, in a section of its own, um, but there are definitely options for you to do that in both Word and PowerPoint. We want to make sure that if you do have more complex images that you're adding, maybe it's a, a diagram or a graph of some sort, that you add captions so that everyone can understand that um, even without vision, right? And then we want to make sure that the hyperlinks that we're adding to these documents are also descriptive, so more than just click here or read more. And this is another thing that's going to be a larger section um, a little bit later. Oops. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is, is linking out to external websites, right? So the websites that you link to need to be accessible as well, even if you weren't the creator of that website. Um, and so the way that we take responsibility for that is by running it through a web accessibility evaluation tool. And so the one I like to use is, is the WAVE tool. Um, you can do just a, a quick search for that, and it'll allow you to plug in the um, the URL that you want to test. It gives you an output that looks a little bit more like this. And so I ran this on Yahoo. Um, and this was a screenshot from a while ago. So these headlines are definitely out of date. Um, but it shows me that there are 21 big errors and 56 alerts. This is what I always like to look at. And then I click down onto this little flag um, that goes into what are the big errors on this page. And I know from experience from clicking through this that they don't have alt text on most of the images on the Yahoo landing page. Um, and so whether it's that their fault or those that are submitting the headlines or if they're ads that don't have um, that don't have alt text on their images or whatever, it, it still makes it very difficult for someone using a screen reader to navigate. Um, so just as this view is, is chaotic for us to see the output of that um, 
evaluation, it's even more chaotic to try to navigate this web page just by clicking through using a screen reader um, or tabbing through using a screen reader trying to get an auditory explanation of the layout of this page. It can be really chaotic. And so what you're looking for is a page that has, has probably just one or two errors and, and when you go to investigate them, they seem like just a button in the top corner might be a little bit wrongly labeled, right? And I don't expect you to understand ARIA labels. I sure don't. But to understand that this, um, this site or the creator of the site has made an effort towards accessibility. That's what we're looking for. So, um, in the way that you actually send someone to a link, right? We want to make sure that the text in your document or your site or your email is written in a way that is um, giving enough context to those using a screen reader. And so if I can't see the screen and I get to this link that says click here, how do I know where that is going to send me? And that's often how those with screen readers um, or screen reader users might navigate through a page. Um, they might jump from header to header to understand the title and the subtitles of the page. They might also jump from link to link to understand where else this page could take them to really understand where it's situated within a website. Um, same with um, emails. You might have a click here type of link in your email and if someone were to navigate to that link using a screen reader, they might not get the um, the context clues of the sentence before because they might not be read in that exact order. Um, so we want to make sure that we're writing descriptive hyperlinks to provide link context to screen reader users. And I'll show you a couple examples of this, right? And so I've kind of hinted at click here or read more aren't quite as descriptive as we want to get. Um, so a screen reader user would get to that click here link and it would say external link, click here. And they wouldn't necessarily have any, um, any sense of where that was taking them and they would probably move on and not hit enter or spacebar to actually to follow through. And so to make it a little bit more descriptive, I've got an example here that the, the title of the article is five ways to improve accessibility. And so I might add that, oh my goodness, someone's hammering. I'm sorry for the background noise. Um, so I might add that article title as the descriptive hyperlink. Um, it, even within this sentence. And so it would now read out as external link, read the five ways to improve accessibility article. And then the user has a little bit more of an understanding of where that's taking them and why they might want to go there. Same thing with something down here. It's just as simple as going from on this page to on the presentation page. Just a oops, tiny bit more detail about why you might want to go there um, so that that link isn't lost in the mix and has enough context. Cool. So the fourth issue I'm going to go through is alt text. And so this is something that's super relevant to images wherever you're placing them. So whether you're placing them in a website or an email or a PDF or a PowerPoint or a Word document, you're always going to have an option to add alt text. Um, it just takes a little bit of digging to find the settings to actually add that, right? Um, and so the, the Microsoft software um, or the micro Microsoft Office software has now gotten really good about showing you uh, a box um, with your image options that explains here's a form field for you to type in your alt text and here's why. And so the reason why um, is, is kind of the same as the, as the hyperlinks. A screen reader user would get to that image and it would just say image and it wouldn't read out anything else unless you told it what to say. Um, sometimes, like especially in Carmen Canvas, it will default to read out the file name, and most of the time our file names are not super descriptive, right? The one here, Buckeye Leaf Gray CMYK.png, that's not terrible, right? It gives the user a little bit of an understanding of what they're missing, um, but we would want to just describe that as a gray buckeye leaf and move on, right? So that when they get there, it says image, gray buckeye leaf, and they know it's just fairly decorative and that they can move on. Um, but if that was just a string of, of letters and numbers, .jpg or .png, that doesn't give us any um, explanation of why that image was added, why it's relevant, or what they might be missing out on. Um, so in any software you're using, you're going to have an option to 
add alt text, so it's alternate text to your images. This is actually now a feature in, in Twitter, um, on Facebook, I think on Instagram, I'm not 100% sure about that one, um, so that you would be able to add that alt text for users as well. Um, so I've got a couple of things here, and so I want to just practice if you guys can um, type in the chat, and this isn't going to be the most creative assignment ever, but if you were to just write some alt text to describe these images, um, what would you say? Okay. Steven said discussion around the table. Absolutely. Maybe it, it has more of a specific meaning given the context of the document it's in. And so maybe it's important that it's medical professionals sitting around the table, something like that, right? And so think about whether or not, yeah, medical professionals having a discussion, six individuals sitting around the table. Really good, yeah, and so that's about as descriptive as we would need to be, right? If this was a more complex image, like a graph or something that had, had numbers or had real detail in it, um, we might consider doing a caption below the image as well or making sure that the alt text that we provide um, is really descriptive so that we're not missing out on anything there. Um, so the way that alt text actually displays is it doesn't. It is connected to the metadata of the photo. And so when a screen reader user gets to it, it reads out to them image and then the alt text if it's available. Um, yes, and Jane said, instead of alt text for that Buckeye leaf, wouldn't it be tagged as decorative or something? Absolutely. Depending on the software that you're in, and that might be the case for both of these photos as well. Depending on the, the software you're in, you, you might have an option to, to check a box to say this is a decorative image, and it'll actually tell the screen reader to skip it completely because there's nothing worth seeing there, right? There's nothing worth explaining there. Um, and so that's something to, to consider as you're exploring and playing around with alt text. What's really important though is with those more complex images, that you were to explain those in alt text or even add a caption or even an audio description below it if you wanted to, to capture a little bit of audio to embed with that. Good question. Okay. All right, my fifth issue, and hopefully I'm okay on time. Yeah, it looks like it. Um, Captioning. This is always one that generates a lot of questions, right? Everybody wants to know how they can do this. Um, so audio or video without transcripts or closed captioning are unusable to those with hearing differences, right? This shouldn't be a surprise to us. Um, but really the truth is that captions actually improve the learning experience for everyone. And so I wonder if in the chat you can pop in some some reasons why you may have turned captions on when you've watched a video in the past or reasons why someone might use closed captions. Aging, sure. Yeah, our, um, our hearing differences definitely change throughout our life, right? That you can't have the volume on, maybe you forgot your headphones, right? Trouble understanding the speaker, couldn't understand the accent. Yeah, wanting to be kind of discreet um, maybe you're English as a second language learner, and maybe there is terminology in the video that you really want to see how it's spelled. Um, maybe it just helps you better process what you're, you're being taught, right? Um, and so there's tons of reasons. Um, I don't know if I have my, my normal slide. Yeah, 80% of those who use captions have no disability. Um, and so it's, it's this idea that goes along with universal design for learning. It's that universal piece, right? That the effort that we put in to make our content more accessible and more inclusive is actually going to benefit everyone um, beyond just the, the specific populations or the specific disabilities that we may be thinking about, right? And so now you scroll through Facebook and almost every video is captioned. And I think it makes it a better experience for everyone. Cool. So your options. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that. So we want to make sure that we're adding cop captions to video content. And I don't know how often you guys are, are producing video content, but this is definitely something to think about. And I encourage you to start with prioritizing 
videos that are going to be public facing, that are going to last a while, that you're not redoing every week or every year. Um, and something that you think is going out to kind of a, a larger audience or might really benefit from captions because it can be overwhelming if you do have a lot of video content. Oops. I'm gonna, Casey, I'm going to get back to your question about alt text in a minute. So this is an example of the background um, or the back end for YouTube. And so there's actually, we've got a guide up on our resource center um, that I will put a link to in the chat when I'm done. Um, but it goes through your options on how to do DIY captioning with YouTube. Um, and so this obviously only works for videos that you've uploaded, um, that you own. Um, and so when you're going out and choosing video, make sure that you haven't created, make sure that you are looking for videos and, um, and choosing videos that have closed captioning if you have a choice. Um, but for your own videos, you can actually go in to YouTube and get into the back end um, of the transcription software and play around with how that's set up. Um, it'll do an automatic captioning, um, which is actually a lot better than it used to be. There are always a few little um, spelling mistakes, especially with names and stuff like that. Um, but you actually have full control to go in and edit those. Um, and then you can then publish those captions, right? So for those of you that might be using Mediasite, I don't know how much of uh, Extension uses Mediasite, our um, Ohio State's platform for video recording and hosting um, that's behind login. Um, but you would actually have an opportunity to do the captioning um, on an unlisted, like not public facing video on YouTube get the captions done, edit the spelling, and then if you go to this little actions tab, you can actually download the SRT file, which is the caption file. Then you could take that back into media site and attach it to your video. Um, so there's a little, a little loophole um, kind of thing there for you to do if you wanted to have your stuff a little bit more secure. But we find that unlisted videos in YouTube um, are actually just as good. Cool. So that's one option for you. Unfortunately, um, the captioning market is still pretty manual. Um, I think the technology is getting a lot better, especially in the last five years or so, um, with being able to be automated. Um, and so you'll find vendors that say that they have manual captions and those that have automatic captions. Um, and I think that the accuracy is, is uh, the gap is closing on that, right? Um, and so soon at the Ohio State University, we'll have um, pre-negotiated contracts with captioning vendors that you'd be able to, to opt into um, with a departmental purchase. So that's something to, to keep in mind if you've got a ton of videos and you're feeling anxious about how to get those captioned, but I can always offer advice on that. So here is a summary, and I know Casey had a question about alt text, so I'm going to address that now, but if anybody else has questions about documents, websites, descriptive hyperlinks, alt text, or videos, you can type those into the chat. So Casey said, back to the images, do we only need to include alt text or image cap caption if it's pertinent to the material? If it displays something that is not offered in accompanying text. So I'd say, yeah, I think if you've got info that is in the image and is also offered in accompanying text, you could mark that image as decorative. What we really want to be careful about is that if there is something or some meaning being added by that image being there, we want to add alt text to it, right? Um, you can definitely, most of the images that we're placing in our course pages or something like that, like our headers at the top of our course pages are decorative. And so we mark those um, as decorative in Canvas, but that's definitely something to think about. Cool. Any other questions about those five big best practices or low hanging fruit, kind of easy things to start to implement? All right, I'll keep looking at the chat, but I've got just a couple more slides here. Um, I think I've got about a minute. So 
we want to think about whether you're evaluating or creating materials, right? And you're, there's a responsibility on you um, through the university's digital accessibility policy um, that would ask you to make sure that there is accessible material being being put out. And so, especially on public facing sites, this is really, or spaces, this is really important. Um, the responsibility is on you and your department to make sure that things are accessible. Um, I'll also place a link to the digital accessibility policy if you're interested in reading up on that. There is a, um, an accessibility coordinator through the um, College of Food, Ag, and Environmental Sciences who is I believe Eric, um, Eric Moore, who was on the last webinar, who would be also able to answer more complicated questions. Um, but what we want to think about is when you're evaluating resources to use, do the documents have a structure that make it easy to navigate? Do the websites have a, a structure that's easy to navigate? Um, do hyperlinks have descriptive text? Do images have alt text? Do videos have closed captions? I don't ask you to dive much deeper than that. These are surface level things that you could see um, to understand whether accessibility was a priority in those who created that content, right? And then when you're creating your own content, create documents that use heading structures and tables of contents and that organize things clearly. Um, link to websites that are reliable and credible and accessible. Make sure you're vetting those just like you would for um, for credibility or timeliness or bias or anything like that, right? Um, write descriptive hyperlinks in your materials. Add alt text to images and graphs. And I shouldn't have said all images, right? We know that there are exceptions when it's decorative. Um, and then caption your videos and, and write a script if possible when you're, when you're creating videos, um, knowing that that would help you with your captions or with a transcript later on and start from where you are, right? Start with just one piece of content. Ask yourself what's useful about it. What do users need to do with the content? What might be a barrier to them engaging with this, right? We're thinking about just in that digital space. Cool. So there's some further learning here um, and I will send my slides along um, if, those, if you guys want to distribute those, but We've got the Resource Center, which is um, an OD website. We've got uh, u.osu.edu slash distance education, which is the blog that has a whole section on accessibility. And then outside of OSU, WebAIM is a great place to go um, to understand a little bit more about the best practices for accessibility. And then I've personally gathered some accessibility links each with an explanation of why you might check that out or learn more from that. And so that's go.osu.edu slash access links, lower, um, lowercase. Great. So we might have time for a couple questions. Oh, okay. So running OCR on, on documents and thinking about the copyright implications of that. Um, I believe that it isn't modification um, when we're talking about copyright. I think that's a really good question, but I believe it's not modification of any of the content. Um, it's just a slightly better displayed version of it. Um, so I think it's covered. Good question. Okay. So I will um, stay on for a few more minutes if you've got accessibility questions, you're still kind of percolating, but here's my contact info and I'll turn it back over. Thanks, Megan, we appreciate your time today. Yeah. I am having trouble getting my PowerPoint and my Zoom to share space, so I don't think I'm going to be able to. Um, can everybody see my PowerPoint slide? Yep, we can see it. Perfect. Um, so thank you for coming. Megan, that was very interesting. That's definitely one of my 
areas that I'm glad to have other people refer to, the documents and such. Um, my name is Laura Ackerman. I am the Disability Services Coordinator with Ohio AgriAbility and OSU Extension. My contact information is up there and it's also on my last slide. And a quick plug for Ohio AgriAbility, we work with farmers with disabilities throughout Ohio. So if you ever come across anyone like that, let us know. Hello. There we go. So, um, a question that I do hear sometimes, unfortunately, is why do I have to have my event in an accessible site or make my event accessible? Because I've never had anybody in a wheelchair come to any of my events. So it's a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, there are people who have disabilities who do not use wheelchairs. And sometimes people might think, I'm not gonna be able to go and access it, so I'm not gonna bother. And that is definitely not what we want. We want every, everyone to be able to come to any extension event, regardless of their ability. Uh, like Megan had mentioned, universal design, that's something we strive for also. So why do we have to? Uh, there's some federal laws, and I actually just spent the morning at the OSU Extension Civil Rights Roadshow, and um, they're going around the state and doing trainings on different civil rights, so if anybody's been to that. Um, but there's the Architectural Barriers Act. Really important one for us in Extension is the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Um, Section 504, a quick summary says, no qualified individual with a disability may be discriminated against, here's the important part, in any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. And I just heard Jeff McCutcheon say this morning that Extension, which I assume is OSU Extension, receives 11 million in federal funds every year. And I know that individual counties probably don't see an awful lot of that, but if we get any federal money, we have to make things accessible. And then of course the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I will have a resource page up on the Ohio AgriAbility website by the end of this week. I'll have links to these laws and a number of the um, fact sheets that the Department of Justice has done that goes into more detail on ADA Section 504, um, accessibility at temporary events and some other things that are really helpful. So when you think Again, the visible disability is the most obvious one, but according to the census, uh, the American Community Survey that they do every year, and then Cornell University does a report every year looking at different states. I will have a link to that. But 14.1% of Ohioans have a disability. That is a lot of people. At some point in their life, 70% of Americans will have a temporary or a permanent disability. And then 21% of Americans age 15 and over do have a disability of some sort. And then of course, the older you get, the more likely you are to have a disabling condition. And so up to 50% of Americans 65 and older have some sort of a disability. So there's a lot of people, it's not just a very, very few. Um, so let's make them all feel welcome. So when I think about my goals for creating accessibility, I always wanna be proactive because it's so much better to plan it right now, whether it's your event, it's a workshop, it's the county fair, it's field day, whatever it is, it is so much better to be able to plan in advance, you've got it done, it's part of your planning checklist, rather than someone, sh someone arrives at your event and you don't have a way to get them into the building or to accommodate them once they're there. So anything, and you're, you are not gonna be able to foresee every single in every single thing that could possibly come up. But by being proactive, I think we can make things a lot easier on everybody and make people feel like we belong and they belong and that we want them there. Um, I always think of it as the golden rule when I have people that push back on me and not necessarily an extension. I used to work in higher education for disability services and I would get a, quite a bit of pushback sometimes. But think about how you would wanna be treated Think about how you would want your friends, your family, your child, your coworkers to be treated. Being welcome, being able to just come in and independently attend an event, interact with people, go to a website. I mean, that's all we, that's all any of us want. So that should always be a goal when you're planning events and creating accessibility. So the cost of accessibility, um, many accommodations don't cost anything or they may have 
have a very low cost. It can be as simple as I'm in a room right now, it's a basement meeting room and there is an elevator that accesses it. Somebody could come in, the tables are set up in, an, in a big block O, it's Ohio State block O. So what you'd really have to do here is if you know you had someone coming in with a wheelchair, move a few of the chairs out. They can get right up to the table that didn't cost anything. Um, if you are planning a class, say an ongoing training class, and you have your choice of classrooms within a building or even buildings, pick the one that is accessible, that has accessible parking, that has an elevator if the classroom is not on the first floor, that has an accessible restroom, um, that doesn't have crazy lighting or lots of background noise. So a lot of things, again, by being proactive, most many accommodations don't cost anything. It's just a little bit of time and planning. And in addition to that, if someone's still thinking, well, why would I want to accommodate this one person that may or may not show up? Well, when you're looking at universal design for any kind of an event or a facility or um, a garden or property, when you're using universal design, which makes it usable for anybody of any ability to use it as independently as possible, you're increasing the safety and usability of that facility or that site, and it's better for everyone. So if you think, well, you know, ramps are one of a wonderful example of universal design, that ramp was built next to a building so that a person with a wheelchair or a walker or a mobility impairment can get into the building. But you also see people who are pushing baby strollers, people who are pulling kids in a wagon, um, the person who is delivering several cases of bottled water, they all use the ramp, so it works for a lot of people. Accessibil who has to be accessible? Any business or event that's open to the public has to be accessible. That can be a private event, that can be a public event. There is no exemption for temporary events like your county fair, um, your farmer's market, honestly, or events that are open just a few weeks, say the pumpkin patch. I get questions, especially this time of year, around agritourism. Even if it's just a few weeks, if you're open to the public or you have a ticketed event for the public, it needs to be accessible. So how do you make your events or program or facility accessible? You start with providing reasonable accommodations. So in the law, they don't say what is reasonable because you could not cover everything, but they do say what is not reasonable. And I'm gonna go off on the side with this. If someone called you and said, I want to come to your event and I need to be able to get into the building or I need um, programs or I need a screen reader, I would, unless you can immediately say it's in an accessible building, it's in an accessible site, no problem, come in. Ask them what it is they want. If you're not sure what they need, ask them what it is. In the past, have you attended an event like this? How are accommodations provided? Um, what, what specific accommodations are you requesting? Because there's a few reasons. For one thing, if a person has a disability and has had it for honestly any length of time, they are probably world-class problem solvers because they have encountered barriers pretty frequently and they know how to solve the problem. So as much as I love to solve problems, I just need to listen to them. However, just because they ask for something, you are not obligated, you are not opening yourself up to saying, I will do whatever you want. Um, we'd love to be able to say that. Sometimes there are alternate ways to provide an accommodation than from what they asked. But getting back to what's reasonable and not reasonable, so not reasonable and doesn't have to be granted if it requires a substantial change or alteration in the curriculum or to an essential element of a course or program that especially is in academic settings or other teaching and learning settings, or it fundamentally alters the nature of the service provided. If it poses a direct threat to the health and safety of self or others, or poses an undue financial hardship or administrative burden. So the one, when I, as Disability Services Coordinator for Extension, I think most of my interaction outside of agribility is with 4-H uh, because you've got county fairs, you've got project books, you have qualifying horse shows, you have judging going on at fairs and different events, skillathons. So 
you're looking at, mm, that's a completely different um, webinar, but if, if, it, if what they're asking for changes the event or the course so much that it doesn't look like 4-H anymore, give me a call and we'll talk it through. One of the things I think I feel like we come back to a lot when we're talking about accommodations or for camp or for the fair, one of the ones that we look at a lot is, is it posing a threat to the health or safety of this person or others? Uh, again, these are scenarios we can talk through. Um, or if it poses an undue financial hardship or an administrative burden. In the civil rights training that we were in this morning, um, Jeff McCutcheon brought up that a few years ago, there was a person that wanted to go through an extension class and it was the master gardener training, which is pretty extensive, a couple hours at a time. I think he said it's about 50 hours and someone needed American Sign Language interpreter. And if you are an ASL interpreter, generally you don't work more than one hour straight. So if it's a two or three hour class, you're gonna have two interpreters and they're not inexpensive. So it was gonna be a pretty large bill and I believe we did pay it. Um, but when it comes back to a county that doesn't have a huge budget and that could break them, that is an undue financial hardship or administrative burden for that county. But when, if it was to go to court, the court would say, well, maybe that county couldn't afford it, but the Ohio State University certainly could afford it. So that's not usually one that, um, that will play, that will, that will work because they will look at not just your little my agribility program they would look at the entirety of ohio state so but again i'll say it a few times i love to work through this stuff i love to talk about these things if you've ever called me about camp or a 4-h club or fair it, i love this stuff so please call me um so who pays for accommodations again when i was just talking about the master gardener the organizer or host of the event so for instance, um, in about a month, OSU is holding their annual extension conference at the Hyatt or the Convention Center downtown Columbus. If someone there needed an ASL interpreter, the Hyatt is not paying for that. Extension is paying for that because they are the organizer of the event. So if you are holding your event at someone else's property, you the organizer are responsible for organizing and paying for the accommodations. Um, just like if you, county extension educator, was, was allowing someone else to come into your, I'm in, I mentioned before, I'm in Delaware County's um, extensions building. I'm in the basement in their meeting room. So if I needed something, they're giving me this space to use because I'm in Delaware, not at my office. But if there was an extension, if there was an accommodation needed, I would be the one making the arrangements, which I would anyway. But if I was not the disability services coordinator, it would still be up to me, even though they're, they're allowing me to use their space. Okay. So again, I said undue financial hardship. It would consider all of OSU resources. And I believe we have some per people from Purdue. It would consider all of Purdue's resources, not just your little, your county. Um, one thing I will say about this over the I think it was spring or summer, um, County Educator up and I believe it was Toledo, was gonna to be doing some programming about SNAP-Ed and that program. And they were hosting it at, or I think they were coordinating it with an agency who worked with people who were visually impaired. And they had a few people who were planning to attend this program. And I think it was at least a few weeks long, I'm not really sure, but they had asked for Braille. So she contacted me, I talked to our ADA coordinator but in the meantime, I also said, could you take it back to the, to the agency, um, let's say services for the visually impaired, I can't remember what it was called, and ask them if I can get you a document that is OCR, that is accessible, could they produce a Braille document? So that's what we did. Um, our ADA office could have done it, but I worked with extension publishing. A few of the documents we had were already accessible but one that was made, um, I believe at OSU, it didn't read in the correct order. So I told them what I needed, they sent it to them, they created a Word document, I sent it back to the educator and the agency she was partnering with was able to produce the Braille. So it was great, it didn't cost OSU anything but some time. So that's a great way if you can work with the community resources 
or the groups that you're working with. It gives them some buy-in on it and also can save, and they have the expertise there. So before people arrive at your event, you need an accessible website, accessible promotion and marketing materials, which Megan just covered how to do all of that, and including in co contact information to a re request accommodations. You should have reserved parking spaces. And this is if you don't have a, a permanent parking lot that has accessible parking signs marked. If you're in a field, for instance, there's a wonderful Lynn's apple orchard near me that does a corn maze. And they, the woman who runs it, has a passion for disability and accessibility and she works really hard on that. But in that maze, if they have, it's a big field, if they want, they mark off some accessible parking, they, you know, paint some lines on the ground and print off some signs from the internet, put them up and say, this is the accessible parking, stay out of it. You can do that if it's you're using a temporary parking space. Make sure that the spaces are close to the accessible entrance, if there's more than one entrance, and near a safe walkway or a safe walking path. Don't make them walk across the lines of traffic. Just think about what's the closest place for them to get to that entrance that's also safe. I mentioned walk, walkways, smooth surface that's not slippery. Um, over at Lynn's Corn Maze, they do not have the field paved. So keep it mowed. Um, in gardens, a lot of time I'll have questions about how to make gardens accessible. There's certain types of gravel that you can use for pathways if you don't want to use a sidewalk or concrete. That will be in one of the handouts that I, that I have available by the end of this week. Your walkway should also be free of debris or barriers on the path. So if it is a sidewalk, terrific. It should be at least 36 inches wide. If it has um, hanging baskets with things hanging down on you from above or planters or some other things coming in at you from the sides or planters or, I don't know, benches or things sitting on the sidewalk, make sure you've got 36 inches and make sure that there's some way, perhaps if things are hanging from above, you don't want somebody who's visually impaired using a cane to walk in and conk their head because there's a planter hanging down. So some way to mark those off or perhaps remove them temporarily. But just think about not only just having that 36 inch of walkway space, but what's around them. Okay. And then if you have, if you need a turnaround, so if your walkway goes into a dead end area and it doesn't continue around to where people could get out of it, they need to have at least a 60 inch diameter. If you're gonna to go to the end of the walkway, have to turn around and come back out, there needs at least a 60 inch diameter space for someone to turn, do a three point turn and get their wheelchair back out and head of the other direction. If you have ticket booths or entrances, um, you should have a rise, I'm sorry, a ramp if there are steps or a threshold to get into the entrance, the ticket booth, the bathroom, anything. Um, it's one inch of rise for every 12 inches of run for ramps to make them safe no steps so if you can have it if you have a ticket booth that goes up a couple of steps if you could at least have a table or a counter nearby that someone doesn't have to go in because i've actually heard people say well it's only two steps okay well if you're in a wheelchair two steps might as well be a thousand steps you're not going to be able to get up that so if you need to have or if you can't manage to have a table or something there needs to be some way that the person who cannot access your entrance to your ticket booth could alert someone on the side so they can come out, take the ticket, sell the ticket, pay the entry fee, whatever it is. And ticket counters, if you do have those, they should be up to 36 inches high, but not higher. Um, just thinking of a person, I'm sitting at a table right now and it's a comfortable table height in front of me. Not sure what the height is, but it's comfortable if I'm seated to reach and to access it. So accessible signs, programs, and directions. If you're going to put up signs, use large print signs in case someone, just like we were saying um, before about hearing, have large print signs so people can read it if they don't have great vision. Um, to indicate accessible restrooms, entrances, exits, places where you're being, where, say your fairgrounds, places where different events or um, programs are being held. Have a written sign with prices and frequently asked questions. If you're not going to have an American Sign Language or on site in your ticket booth, and I'm not saying you need to, but just have a written sign so that if someone does come up and they're hearing impaired 
or they're not able to communicate, you can at least have some things that are already written out so it's easier to communicate. Again, being proactive. And then large print programs, handouts, materials. And again, Megan had already talked about using them with screen readers, which is great. So access inside the Adventure facility, you need to have accessible restrooms. If you have two porta potties, at least one of them needs to be accessible. As in, no steps going up, the floor is flat ground level, you can open the door, it's large enough to get a wheelchair into and use the restroom, hand bars, all that. Um, if you have seating areas, so if it's an event where you're gonna be seating and watching a program or a show, they need to have a good line of sight and you cannot charge a premium for the accessible seating. If you, stages should have ramps, and I'm not saying if it's a Jimmy Buffett concert, he's the only one that needs to be up there, but if it's something where you might be doing an awards ceremony or something where a person might need to get up on that stage, ideally they will have notified you beforehand, I'm gonna need to get up on that stage and so you can rent a stage or rent a temporary ramp so you can get up there. Um, we recognize that doesn't always happen, but if you have the opportunity to have a stage with a ramp, that's great. Because it might be the person who uses a wheelchair, it could be somebody that just sprained their ankle or had a, an, a sports, an, you know, high school athlete that injured their knee and they're on the knee scooter, or it could just be it's someone's pulling it up. It's nice to have a ramp. And again, keeping walkways and aisles clear of barriers. That's on the way in and that is throughout your whole facility. Last of all, I saved this one for last, everyone's favorite topic, service animals. Service animals, according to the Americans with Disabilities Act, they are only dogs or miniature horses. Emotional support, therapy animals, companion animals, they are not covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act and they don't have to be admitted. Saying that, there are housing laws that are different and they may allow support of therapy animals, the Fair Housing Act, and that could even be for temporary housing, dormitories, or let's say your 4-H your band goes to the county fair and spends the week or the state fair bound band. Um, they may be actually supporting therapy animals may be allowed there. But back to service animals, they have to be under the handler's control at all times. It does not mean they have to be on a leash. Some animals need to work off leash, but they need to be within vocal control or, I don't know, hand signal control of, of the handler at all times. There is no certification, there is no training, there is no license, there is no registration for a service animal. If it's a dog and your county says he has to be licensed, yes, he does. But there is absolutely nothing. There are a lot of diploma mills on the internet that will produce Diplomas that say they are certified animals or th certified 30 therapy animals. And when I worked in high, higher education disability services, I would get those occasionally and I would say, that's great. Um, you wasted a lot of money on this because there is no such thing under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So you do have to take it on faith some. The dog does not have to wear the jacket or the vest that indicates they're a therapy animal. I'm sorry, a service animal. Um, but if someone says it is my service animal. It is my service dog. There is no such thing as a service cat or snake or turkey or anything else. Um, but if you are approached by someone who has a service dog or horse, you are only allowed to ask two questions. Is the dog or miniature horse a service animal and are they required because of a disability? You don't get to ask what the disability is and what work or task has the animal been trained to perform? You do not get to ask for a demonstration of the animal's work. So it is very limiting, but it also protects the privacy of the person. And I mean, for a service animal who alerts their owner, if it's going to have, if the owner is going to have a seizure, you, you can't ask for a performance of that, a demonstration. Um, so even if it's not obvious, a seeing eye dog for a person who's visually impaired, Unfortunately, you have to do have to take it on faith and there are people according to my news feed because I look at articles like this So I get more articles like that where people will try to game the system But service animals are allowed they are allowed anywhere except in Maybe a hospital ICU or a sanitary setting probably not allowed in the surgery room um, 
or in certain food preparation areas. They're allowed in restaurants though. That's why I leave service animals to the end. That's usually a kind of a hot topic as it should be. So that's all I have right here. I will put in a plug for um, the OSU Extension Annual Conference. I will be presenting on this topic, will be more about this topic, um, Wednesday from, I believe it's 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. approximately. I'll have some scenarios there because I think it's always helpful if I can offer scenarios or case studies and the attendees can work through those and problem solve. But again, I, I do have a handout made up. I'm gonna add a few more links to it. Um, it'll be on Ohio AgriAbility's website by this Friday. It's agribility.osu.edu on the resources page. And there's my name, phone number, and email. Any questions? Thanks, Laura. Um, I'll keep an eye out here in the chat box. If Thank you. Questions that come through. I'm going to stop the recording. Um, I appreciate okay. your time today. And thank you to everyone who came.